much for having me. It's always a pleasure for me to share my story with any audience at all because um, a story changed my life. Um, and the, the theme of my, topic, of my talk here this afternoon is nothing means anything except the meaning you attach to it. Nothing means anything except the meaning that you have given it. A few days ago, I clocked 32. And thank you. And until I was 17 years old, I had no idea who my father was. Growing up, my middle name was Bastard. Whenever I had any quarrel or arguments with neighbors, they were quick to point out that I was Temitokbe Bastard. And even my mother was not spared. Whenever she had rancor or fight or arguments with neighbors, they were quick to call her sluts because she had a child outside wedlock. My earliest memory of my father was at my seventh birthday. I was told he was coming to surprise me. I wondered how would I recognize him when he steps into the, the room. My mom said, don't worry, you look just like him, so you will know him when he walks in. I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. So I waited till it was too late to wait. He never showed up. No apologies, no explanations, he just never showed up. That night, I cried myself to sleep. But before I slept, I swore to sue him. I swore to make him pay for breaking my heart that day and for everything my mother had ever had to go through as a single mother. When I was eight, my mother got married to a man who had three children. So I got myself a sister and two brothers. Unfortunately for us, I and my mom, this man wanted more children. My mother could not provide. He had this habit of abusing me verbally and emotionally. As a matter of fact, every single day, he would give me half of whatever he gave his children for lunch. With his encouragement, my mom sent me out to a kitty to have my secondary education. While there, I picked up a local accent. And so, when I returned back to Lagos, my friends and neighbors would call me and ask me questions just so I could speak, and they would laugh their heads off. And I would go, And people would laugh, like, what are you saying? Unknown to me, I had picked up a funny accents because it was not Lagosian. From there, I got self-conscious. I stopped speaking. And when you asked me to speak, I would stammer. And that was how I became a stammerer. Now, stammering of its own is not a crime. But when you have to explain your own side of an argument, and all you can do is cry, because you don't have the words to explain yourself. You begin to see stammering as a disability. When you join the debate club and all the session, you were never called up to the stage to deliver a debate. Then you know that you are suffering from a disability. Now, when you have the vision to one day stand before a judge to sue your father, you know that your chances are pretty slim. My mom lost her marriage because she could not have a child. And so we were forced to sleep and stay in her shop for over one year. It was a really trying period for us. At that moment, I knew I had to seek my father. I had to find him. Everywhere I went to, where my mom pointed me to, 
he could not be traced. Until one fateful day, she said, oh, she saw, she thinks she saw a man who looks like him drive out of a mansion on her way to church. So I was encouraged. With nothing but fearful courage, I walked onto the mighty gate and I knocked. I met a woman there who confirmed that it was indeed the home of Mr. Gani Yulawa. He said, how can I help you, young lady? Like, well, I've come to see him. Oh, he's not home right now. Do you want to leave a message? I said, yes, verily, I would like to. So I left him this very long note. More like a hate speech, actually. And I gave everything into that note. Everything my mother told me about him. I said, now I am ready for vengeance. I'm going to sue his sorry ass. I'm going to do all of that. And I left the notes. The woman asked me to come back the following day, a Sunday morning, and I would see him. While at, the following day, I was at his house. And upon seeing me, the woman began to shout. Obviously, she had read my note, hate speech. And she felt, she went, who are you? Who is your mother? There is no room for you in this house. We don't have any room for bastards. Go to where you're coming from. My father was there. He was shaking. He was all fidgety. And he went to his room, came back with his complimentary card, and said, take, please. He was shaking. Take and um, see me tomorrow in my office. I was not even offered a seat in my own father's house the first time I would be seeing him. The following day, I was at his office, and then he gave me his own side of the story. Apparently, he loved my mother, wanted to marry her as his Nigerian wife, because he had a wife in the UK. So, it was agreed that she should conceive to show her fertility before they make it official. Unfortunately for him and for my mom, his wife caught a whiff of his intentions and then threatened hell. You can't be married to me legally and marry any other wife. And I would not allow you to enter into the UK if you ever do that. Because, hey, she was a legal wife. So according to him, he lost his balls and asked my mom to please abort her pregnancy. The awesome woman you see in front of you today. She said no. She was a grown woman, 27 years old, that there is no way she would ever abort that pregnancy. So she chose. At a time when single motherhood was not sexy, she chose to be a single mother. She raised me all by herself, secondary, university, and my father did not at any point show up. Well, back to his office. He was sorry. He promised he would change. Okay then. But I was not convinced. I was still on my mission to sue him. After I finished my secondary school, I couldn't get an admission into the university, into, to study law at the university. So I went for English instead. So while my mates finished English, I went on to still reapply to study law. In between, I lost my mother. And for over three years, my father did not look for me. This was me, a single child with no relatives. I became homeless. And I knew I was determined to sue him. But something happened to me. Rather, I met a mind. She's a lady I met at a hospital. She had hunchback. And then she was pregnant, so she was suffering from some, for some backache. And 
when I saw her, she had this beautiful phone. I'm like, oh, ma, I could help you to print out pictures from your phones. And she said, oh, really, is that possible? Yes, I had a small device. I was a hustler. So I was doing any and everything. Washing clothes, ironing them, selling bread, pure water, everything in school to make ends meet. Thank you very much. So she took me to her home and she showed me, for the first time in my life, I saw an inverter. She showed me her husband, tall, dark, handsome, and yes, rich. I'm like, oh my God, how? She said, tell me, sit down, let me tell you a story. She told me a story of how she had been engaged to a man who was abusing her, who never ceased to point out her hunchback. And she said, one day, the guy's aunt told her that, Jumoke, you deserve better than this. The way my nephew treats you is not how I would want my daughter to be treated. So she made a statement that day, and she said, Tammy, never ever forget this. You are an amazing woman. You are an amazing human being. Whoever does not love you have a bad taste. I'm like, okay. If you don't love me, you have bad taste. And that was how it sank into my head. I'm not defined by the labels. My father's rejection of me doesn't make me who I am. Who I am is deeper. It's beyond my gender, beyond my name, beyond my tribe, beyond anything. Who I am is deep within me, and I know that I am a transformer. <clears throat> While in the university studying law, I met my husband and got, ma got married to him, had my child. And then somehow, while I was in law school, I stumbled on a business. And within three weeks, I made the fastest million in my life. I was a millionaire. And so I discovered myself, though I love to teach, I love to speak, I love to train. I was born to do this, even though I was still a stammerer. And so I told myself, my father, has become too small a reason for me to study law. He had become too unimportant for me to dedicate any more time of my life to want to pursue a course after wasting six years of my life just so I could sue him. I found peace. I found forgiveness. And more importantly, I became super grateful for him. So I thought to myself, I am not who I am today in spite of him. Nope. I am who I am today because of him. Every single thing he did to me, every single thing I had to go through led me here today. So I'm grateful for him, and so I placed him on his salary. It's been over two years now. I take care of him and pay him a monthly allowance. And sometimes when I see his call, it will be to ask me, talk my bow new, kinny emio tea Meaning, how are you? Talk by I've not seen that thing. Oh. That's the, the alert. And I'm like, oh the nerve. The girl you never took care of. But hey, no venom, no hate. I come from a place of gratitude. A place where I know that he was a significant player to the woman I am today. So like I said earlier on, I stumbled on a business I could do right from my mobile phone. And I became a millionaire. And so I said, you know what? This particular gospel, I have to preach it to the world. People ask me, why housewives? And I say, oh my God, you need to understand the label and the conditioning that happens when they call you a housewife. 
When you think housewife, you think, okay, a woman with scattered head, a woman with a um, uh, spoon on one hand, broom on the other, with a child crying at the background. She's everywhere. She has to call her husband for diaper, has to call her husband for this. I'm like, no. If you are a woman, so far you can have access to the internet, you can make money online. You don't have to leave the comfort of your home to make money. And that was how I, became, I, I began the movement, the millionaire housewives. And I said, not only for housewives, anybody who has a passion in their hearts, any savvy and passionate person who believes there is more to them than the labels, who believes that their lives can be more meaningful than where they've been, who says, you know what, I will not allow my background to put my back to the ground. These are the people I believe I've been called to. Because I used to wear a label, but no, not anymore. And I say, you know what? You can choose to redefine yourself. You can choose to reinvent yourself. A Chinese proverb says, he who blames others has a long way to go. He who blames himself is halfway there. He who blames no one has arrived. So I say, you know what? Thank you very much. Let's stop the blames. We have, we have all been through one thing or the other. And if you're here today, you, you've had any form of disadvantage or any form of experience, I'd love you to do a switch today and say where you are today, and where you're going tomorrow is being prepared for by where you've been. You can choose to make a different, a, think the trajectory of your life by choosing to be grateful than to have anger and any unhealthy feeling in you. Because indeed, nothing means anything except the meaning that you've attached to it. If at any point my story resonates with you, I want you to look at me now and say, I can reinvent myself. I can redefine my experiences. I can choose my meaning. Because nothing means anything except the meaning I attach to it. Thank you for listening. Woo!